I think I'm just fascinated that I could experience something that other people are experiencing, have written about and talked about. But since we're all on different sides of the planet or different sides of the country or different places, we don't even know. And then when you realize like, oh yeah, like nothing I do is really original and someone has already done it somewhere else, it's kind of beautiful and relieving and takes off so much pressure to quote, think you're special because I think I grew up in a world in America thinking like, you're gonna save the world. You have to be an activist. You have to stand up for your country. Whether I was a Republican or a leftist, like people were always putting, you know, this burden on you to save the world. And I think they neglected to remember that in that process, you've got to remember to save yourself without being resentful, without being bitter and without hating the world. And I think that takes like a very specific type of introspection that most people don't know how to practice. So let's listen to Dr. K talk about that in relation to men their mental health, and their statistics in terms of them unaliving themselves. Why are men unaliving themselves at insane rates? Spoiler alert, introspection. But let's talk about why they're not introspecting. Dr. K. Stephen. With all of your work and all of the content you've produced, if someone's just clicked on this podcast now, what do you think they're going to get out of this conversation? What do you think they're going to walk away with? Uh, I hope what they'll walk away with is the realization that you are the instrument of your life and understanding that fundamental instrument that you use to live your life, your body, your mind will ultimately help you accomplish whatever you want. Amen. That right there is the thing that was like a key tool for me to recognize like, oh, oh, like I didn't realize that. I think I knew it on some subconscious level, but I didn't realize that I was the key component. And what is the opposite mindset to that, to understanding that you're the instrument of your life? What is the typical mindset that people have that go through their lives think, without the realization that they are the instrument of their life? I think it's assuming that something outside of them will fix things inside of them, right? So people will think like, okay, if I get a promotion, then I'll be happy. If I date this person, then I will be happy. If I have this amount of money, I will be happy. Everyone assumes that things outside of you will fix things inside of you. Yep. Why is- Wait, that is so key. That was the thing that I couldn't understand. Like, okay, I had a job. I had friends. I had relationships. Why am I miserable? I was living on my own. I was accomplishing goals. Why am I miserable? Now, part of it was that I was suffering from undiagnosed like borderline personality disorder. I was suffering from internalized like issues with all of my upbringing. And then obviously when I went to therapy and I fixed or slash got the medical need I needed for the mental health stuff, I was like, okay. And then it was like the philosophy stuff. Now the reason of the why was so imperative for me to understand why was I working so hard? Why was I trying to work three jobs? Why was I trying to do anything? Why was I trying to date? Why was I having friends? Like, why did I even want these things in the first place? What was missing from my life that I needed? Obviously, it was a sense of belonging. Why didn't I belong to any bubble that I hopped into? Why do I never feel a part of the group? Oh, because ultimately, I'm relying heavily on my why. My capital Y, W-H-Y, Y. Oh, and that's going to stem from my values and the relationship I'm having to reality. And most people don't think that way. Most people do think I'm going to externalize my experience and I'm going to be externally motivated. And I'm a very internally motivated person. So I'm not going to do anything I don't want to do. Even earlier when you guys were suggesting talk to Dr. K, I would love to, but I'm not going to do it unless I know what I want to talk to him about. Otherwise, like I don't want to do it. And it's as simple as like, I don't want to do it, therefore I'm not going to do it. But I understand that externally, it would be good for my views. I could fake a conversation with him, but it's not going to be good for me. So as a business person, I could say, well, externally, the viewership will perceive this interview as really amazing, even though internally I'm screaming because I don't know why I'm having this conversation with someone. Because in my brain... Like, but I can't actually do that. I can't perform the external expectation, which is why I was alienated eventually because eventually I would ask someone like, why are we doing this? And they'd be like, what do you mean? I'm like, why are we doing this? Same thing with Dr. K. I know externally you're like, oh, views. It would be an interesting conversation. But like I internally have no, no reason to know why I would be doing that yet. And until I know why I'm doing it, like I don't do stuff. So again, 
I think that that, knowing that about myself has just made my life so much better. I'm happier, I'm joyful, I stopped wanting to unalive myself. Like when, when I turned 30, I've I've gotten married, I've, you know, solidified so much of my close relationships, how I do business, I've made good money, I've done, everything has worked out, but on the healthier side of it, now I know why I'm doing everything. Now I know why I'm talking to people, why I'm making content, why I'm falling in love, why I have friends, why I maintain a relationship with the people in my life. I know why. Before, I just thought, well, this will make me happy. But it wasn't. You know? This subject close to home for you. Uh, <laughs> because I used to believe that. So I, I struggled a lot. I mean, I'm, I'm by all definitions of the word an absolute failure. Um, I failed out of college, uh, was finished school at the age of 35 or 36. Mm -hmm. You know, it took me a long time to kind of get on my feet and figure out what I was doing in my life. And I realized that like the reason that I was screwing up so much is because I, I always thought that accomplishing something outside of me or achieving some kind of mm -hmm. goal would make me happy. Mm -hmm. And I didn't understand that all of my problems came from me. I also mm -hmm. blamed all kinds of things outside of me. So I, I would blame circumstances. I would blame. Which is why I don't practice blame. Because I think the blame game. I love it. Let's play the game. Oh, anyway, it's not important. Okay. So when you play the blame game, you are missing the point. It feels really good. And I think there is a part of your recovery, especially in trauma, where you have to acknowledge like your actions turned me into this. Because without my parents and the environment I was raised in, I wouldn't have had borderline most likely. I wouldn't have had that relationship with that. Right. I would have grown up differently. So in some ways, they're the reason I have borderline. But in many ways, I'm the reason I didn't get better from it because I didn't acknowledge that I needed to find it. Right? So for me, I am excited that I am in control of my life to such an extent that I can let go of the attachment of what I'm not in control of and allow myself an opportunity to take control in what I can. And that took a long time to figure out. You know what I mean? My professor is biased. This girl is, you know, she she doesn't see the the goodness that I have in me. She can't recognize how awesome I am. So I kept on blaming things outside of me instead of accepting responsibility. Mm -hmm. Take me from that point onwards. So what happened... Uh, that that brings you to sit here today as an accomplished individual, as a doctor, and so on. So I, th I think my journey starts with failure. So I, I think we think mm -hmm. about failure as a negative thing, but I think that that's what actually got me started on my journey. Okay, literally, I have a video I made. It's private now. Barack Obama said, like, basically, failure is just necessary for success. And I internalized that when I was in my early 20s. And I was like, yeah, I fail a lot. Like I tend to fail a lot and I turned my relationship with failure into a benefit and proof that I was trying. And ever since then, I've completely like let go of my ego and relationship to failure, basically. Not perfectly, but basically we're to the point where people are they don't understand why I'm not like ashamed to say like, oh, I don't know that. Well, because I view it as an opportunity to learn where they view it as an opportunity to admit failure and they don't want to admit failure. And I don't care. Like my husband today was asking me about like Hitler and history and like what happened on this day 100 years ago. We were like looking up like what happened on this day and, you know, and he was like, oh, do you know about this? Oh, do you know about this European history? Oh, do you know about this European history? I was like, nope, no, 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 I don't know that. And I'm sure somebody somewhere is like, oh, my God, I can't believe you don't know that. And I used to be like that, like, oh, my God, I can't believe you don't know that. But the truth is, is like, yeah, I don't know that. And I understand internalizing that shame of being like, oh, my God, why don't I know things other people know? But obviously, like, eh, what are you going to do? You don't know something. Better to say you don't know and to learn it then and there than to pretend you know and then never, like, actually understand the context. You know what I mean? Kayla says it's 30, the magic age where people don't want to don't want to end alive. If I make it five more days, I'll be set. No, 30 is an indicator. So there's like times in a human's brain and like development in which there are significant actual like things that happen at certain ages. Uh, 30 seems to be some for some people and some bubbles. 
but it's not like a universal experience, obviously. But like some things do tend to happen in patterns. So there's patterns with certain age groups. I think 30 is one of them for many people, but I don't know if the data is like reflecting that in many ways. For neurodivergent people, they say like some people's, you know, frontal cortex like forms closer to 30 than 25. For other people, they feel like, oh, these are like the milestones you need to reach by a certain age. You know what I mean? <clears throat> All of those things are, you, you know what I just, for me, Women who reach 30, they tend to change. My mom even told me I would change significantly at 30. She was right. Uh, 30 just feels like the time to grow up. In my opinion, in my bubble, 30 is just like, if you haven't figured it out by 30, like, you know, like something. Like 30 is a time to figure out a lot about your life for me. Ingrid says you clearly didn't grow up as a gifted child. I don't know that's what that's in refer like reference to, but I was homeschooled, so... We were all gifted at the end of the day, you know. <laughs> After failing out of college, I went to India and I stayed in a monastery or ashram mm -hmm. for about three months and it completely changed the way that I looked at the world. So what I sort of realized is that kind of like what I was saying is that, see, I had assumed that. Ooh, I love that Maiden and Colleen at the same time said it was 35 for me. I love that. I love that. I'm almost 35 in May. I'm really excited. I feel much more settled in my life. So I feel like 35, like I'm exactly like in a great spot at 35. But that's so cool that both of you said 35 at the same time. I fucking love that. Thing I heard the men also feel more like men and grown up by 35 too in America. But the, this was a long time ago I read this. Things outside of me were responsible <laughs> for things inside of me. So as a simple example, I attached my net, my sense of self-worth to getting an A. Yep. So I when I went to when 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 I went to college, I was planning on becoming a doctor. And as any Indian kid wants to do, I wanted to go to Harvard. And so I had sort of all these grand dreams of what I wanted to accomplish in life and how I wanted to be a good force in the world and all this kind of stuff. It's all ego. Mm -hmm. And and so what sort of happened Which is why it's a red flag when people are like, I just want to dedicate myself to helping people. If you do it out of ego, red flag. If you do it out of purpose, different. Purpose, I think, is about finding symbiosis with your consciousness and your like higher self rather than like, oh, I'm going to help people out of ego. Helping people out of ego, in my opinion, is like not a good sign. But wanting to say like, oh, this is just my like life's purpose. And this life's purpose is about like a humility relation, like a humble relationship I'm having. You know what I mean? With my consciousness and like my my sense of purpose on earth that's different and i think that's what dr k is talking about as well as he was searching a purpose from ego versus a purpose with like a symbiosis relationship with his consciousness that brought him actual peace rather than one that brought him a lot of anxiety because it was about other people validating his life choices so the difference again is like i'm going to say it in a different way is like if your purpose is about how other people view your purpose that's a mistake. That's ego, right? How you view it by the validation of how the people view it outside. And then the difference of finding purpose is internal. And that's why when I do core work with people, like on my calls or we talk about it, and again, like I'm just a person having a conversation, something that worked for me, no guarantee it will work for you. But for me, realizing my core self, my values, who I was as a consciousness separate from the world's like perception of me, and then figuring out like my purpose inside of that was the key component to me moving on with my life and actually being really, really just joyful about it. You know, figuring out me in the most humble and grateful way allowed me to also have a better and most, much healthier relationship with my ego, right? Whether my ego was hurt or my ego was inflated. It is even though I wanted all of these things, I assumed that all of that accomplishment would bring me happiness. It's when I went to India that I sort of discovered mm -hmm. that like no amount of external accomplishment will bring you lasting happiness. And this is what we sort of see. These are the, the people that I work with now. You know, I'll work with someone like a banker or a doctor or a content creator. And for all of these people, it's like once you accomplish your goal, mm -hmm. your mind moves the goalposts. Yep. So you got promoted yep. to vice president. Now you need to be director. Then you. This is something I learned about again during my figuring out who I was. I came across all of this information, just not from Dr. K. So I love that he's like taking it and condensing it. I was like reading books and when I read this, that people, once they reach goals, move for the next one. I was like, stop. 
because I didn't want to get stuck in the cycle of thinking I had never gotten enough. I had never been enough. I'm never enough because that cycle is one that I was trapped in for so long. And I was like, why don't I feel like I'm enough? Why didn't I do it? And it was, again, seeking out outside validation instead of what I what I personally internalize as like valid, you know? You need to be managing director, then you need to be, you know, it, there's always more. The mind always wants more. So chasing after all of that will never lead to lasting happiness. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So once I sort of started to realize that, I kind of gave up all of my desires for accomplishment. Um, and the real paradox there is that as I let go of all of my goals, I started to become more successful. And so instead of trying to be something great, I just focused on, you know, small targets. I sort of focused on my spiritual practice. Mm -hmm. I tried to become uh, a monk and take vows at the age of like 22 and my teachers rejected me. I love that. I love that. Two of my brothers tried to become priests and the priesthood was like, nah, it's not for you, son. You're not meant to be a priest. I really think that's commendable. You know, to say like, nah, you're not, you're not, you're not going to be a monk, my bro. And look, he didn't end up a monk. His real, his real purpose was to be a father and a husband and a therapist. You know what I mean? I think it's a really good sign. So they said, I said, I'm ready to forsake my life. And they said, you have nothing worth giving up. You have, your life is meaningless. Like you have nothing worth. <laughs> <laughs> they said you got nothing. Uh, the shade from the monks, bro. Worth giving up. So go back to the United States, rise as high as you can, finish a doctoral degree, actually get something worth giving up. And oh. then at the age of 30, if you still want to take vows, we'll <gasps> take you. 30. Age of 30. There's something about 30. 30 really is like for many Americans who are millennials. I think it's generational. So for 30s for millennials, think about it, guys. If you're a millennial, and I could be wrong, but generally speaking, if I think about what millennials have been going through, and I'm an 89 millennial. By the time I was 30, I really spent my whole 20s working and partying and being unaliving, like wanting to unalive and figuring out my life and like what I was doing with it. And I was just trying to figure out if I was going to be in my parents' bubble or a different one or whose bubble was I going to be in. And by 30, I got serious about my life. I got serious about my career on YouTube. I got serious about everything. And at 30, that was it for me. But also... Um, there seems to be a trend where millennials, we had a lot, we had a lot, like we had a lot to do. I wonder, I wonder what it was. Mm, yeah. A lot of my friends went to college, worked, but then like kind of didn't do much. Their 30s seemed to be much better for them. I don't know though. I don't know. Everyone's having a different relationship with it for sure. What situation must you have been in at that point though, before you went off at sort of 21 years old to that ashram to be so prepared to give everything up because because I heard that reading through your story that you were you had addictive behaviors at that point already yeah so I I struggled a lot with video game addiction um so I, I started playing video games when I was very young and then in high school it really started to impact my grades mm -hmm. in college I was basically playing video games all day long instead of KO says I think it's going to be 40 for us Gen Zers honestly I kind of think so maybe Maybe, and by the way, just a reminder, all these baby boomers that raised us and claim they raised us right and don't want to acknowledge anything they did wrong. If you raised us so right, why are we fucking up? I was thinking about that today, how all these like boomers are like the, the new generation's ruining everything. All these people are ruining everything. All these millennials are like Gen Z is so soft. Um, You raised us. So do you agree you raised us incorrectly? No, no, no. It wasn't me. I raised you correctly. It was the liberal media. It was Reddit. It's because you're a red pillar. It's everyone else's fault but yours. And ultimately, it's our responsibility to stop blaming our parents and to start getting our shit together. But our parents got to stop blaming us and get their shit together too. But like going to class and stuff like that. Like I remember waking up the morning of my Spanish final. So this is my final exam. And then realizing that I like wasn't very prepared for it. So I just turned off my alarm clock and went back to sleep and therefore guaranteed failure. Have you guys ever done something like that? So he's about to have, he has a math or a Spanish final, realizes he's not prepared for it. Instead of going to it, turns around, hits the alarm and goes back to bed. That's an amazing story in so many ways. I've done stuff like that. And I look back at my life and I recognize those moments where I'm like, I'm not, it's not going to be. I was going to community college out of a high school and I was working because like that's what you would do. 
And I didn't want to go to school. I wasn't flourishing in school. I was having a hard time. I didn't understand it. I couldn't even understand how to get to my classrooms. Like I knew how to do it, but something about my brain just like, I'm, I'm just not, okay? Now I passed classes. I did homework. I wrote essays. I did all that crap. But like, I just hated every fucking part of it, bro. And I remember at one point I decided I'm just not going to go to school anymore. And I would leave my mom's house and I'd be like, going to college. And I would literally go to the park and fall asleep in my car and chill. And I would tell my parents, and I was paying for this. So like, fuck everybody. Because they're like, oh, I was paying my own fucking bills. Okay, so fuck all of you. But I was already paying for everything. Okay. And I told my parents, I was like, I'm quitting school and I'm just going to work full time. And that's when I started working three jobs. Like I just, I tried college for like a year or two or whatever it was. I got to my second year and I quit. I was like, I'm not doing this a second year. There's no way I'm doing community college to go to what? A university? I'm not doing this. I don't know why I'm doing this. I don't know why I'm here. Again, if I don't have a goal, like why the fuck am I here? So anyways, I quit everything and I just started working full time. And look, I'm the only kid that ended up a YouTuber. Kind of makes sense. I'm the only kid who ended up like really working for herself. My other siblings, like some of them went to college. Um, some of them work for other companies and, uh, and did like, um, uh, uh, what's that? What's that kind of schooling you do when it's like the middle ground? It's not like uh, when it's a focus trade school. They did trade school stuff. You know what I mean? I'm the only kid who like fully works for herself. And you know what I mean? Is doing this kind of work. Makes sense. You know what I mean? It really does make sense. And so where I was mentally was just in a really bad place. So I, I had all of these goals and aspirations and I was so frustrated with myself that I couldn't bring myself to do what I wanted. Right. So I, I, I knew that I had to study more every single day. I would wake up and be like, I have to study more. I have to catch up. I've fallen behind. And so I'd have all of these thoughts and no matter how much I wanted something, it seemed like my body or my brain would just not listen to me. It wanted the video game more. It wanted something else more. Mm -hmm. And so what I really was, was in, I had no control over my life. Mm -hmm. I was probably depressed. If I had seen a psychiatrist, I'm sure I would have gotten diagnosed with something. Um, brief periods of suicidality, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. basically waking up at- Ooh, that's another part of mental health that I think is so fascinating. And we say mental health, but it's not even mental, which he's going to go over in a second. But if he had been seen by someone, he probably would have been diagnosed. People think like once you're diagnosed, always diagnosed. But that's not how it works for a lot of diagnoses. For a lot of diagnoses, you like move past it eventually. It's a period of time. For some people, it's chronic and lifelong. And so again, even the relationship we're having with like what is mental health, we're not even using those words like correctly in the same way. So we're even having different conversations Again, going back to those like categories, which category of blue are you talking about? Which one are you being represented by? What's your relationship? Not every person with bipolar has the same lived experience. Not everybody with schizophrenia has the same lived experience. Not everybody with, no, nobody is having the same lived, but we are having the same lived experience as somebody else in our category. So when I meet girls or boys who have borderline, I'm like, oh, what's your experience with borderline? And I can tell who's having the same kind of experience and who's not. I meet people with borderline all the time that I'm like, we're not having the same experience. We did not have the same experience. But then I meet so many people, especially in this audience. I'm like, that was my experience. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like we relate in this way because we're the same kind of category, even though individually we're all having our own unique experiences. So Dr. K says he would have been diagnosed if he had been seen, but since he never was seen, he got over it and moved past it in his own way, which means it kind of like makes you one, you know, it just adds a new layer into how we perceive what is mental health and, and how permanent is it. Noon every day, playing video games all day long. And I also remember like before I, I had to play to the point of absolute exhaustion because if I put my head on the pillow and I did not pass out, <sighs> all of the thoughts that I was keeping at bay with the video games would come rushing back about how I'm ruining my life mm. day after day after day after day. And I was just sort of sinking deeper and deeper and like falling into a pit that I could not climb out of. So the ashram in India tells you that you can't give up your life. What happened then? And why did you specialize in psychiatry? <laughs> so when I went to med school, I mean, when I, when I was in med school, I, was, I still had ego. So, I mean, I still have ego now, but so I, I was gonna like, like 
combine Eastern medicine and sort of focus on evidence-based complementary and alternative medicine. And I was going to be an on oncologist and be a real doctor and save lives. But what I really found is that in med school, um, a couple of things. One is my, my favorite organ was the mind. So what I fell in love with in India was the mind and sort of the internal sense of self and all this kind of stuff. Mm. So I, I really liked that. And then I think that my people were in psychiatry. So the other thing that happened is I was trying to decide between internal medicine and oncology and psychiatry. And so one of my mentors in med school told me, like, do this. So do one month of each and then just ask yourself, which one do you enjoy more? Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, when I was thinking about oncology, this was also chasing a desire, right? I had this idea that I wanted to be a real doctor, right? Because those are like, oh, I want to cure cancer. Like that's like, let's, let's be like a real solid doctor and do mm -hmm. that. And then what I noticed was that now what internal medicine has become is very like sitting in front of a computer. So when you work in a hospital, like eight hours of the day, I'm sitting in front of a computer and you spend very little time with your patients. Yeah. And then over time, I started to, to realize that like, Psychiatry is the only field of medicine that we're losing the war in. So if you look at medical outcomes for things like bypass surgery and stuff like that, those are really good. Mm -hmm. This is really insane to really think about. So we can take your body, Stephen, and we can give you a heart from a different human being. We can give you a kidney from a different human being. We can give you a liver from a different human being. If you have a part of your body that doesn't work, we can literally rip it out of you, stick in a new one, and you will survive. Mm. So mm. outcomes in every field of medicine are improving except for mental health. So mental health is the one area where addictions are getting worse, depression is getting worse, suicidality is getting worse, and this is in spite of advances in neuroscience. So something has happened where we've missed something about the mind, and everyone is getting sicker. Mm. So like this- mm. Okay, before he continues, I absolutely do the same thing with myself all the time. Where I have to remember that because, you know, when I was in community college, I was going to focus on child psychology because I like how people work. And I was like, oh, I like children. I want to be a mom. Like, I'll focus on that. But when, when I was in school and I realized the burden of what it would mean to get my license or to be certified or to have a practice, I realized like, oh, I don't want to be a part of this system because I don't work well with rules. Like I work well with rules. I'll follow TOS on YouTube, of course. Like I'm happy to do that. But bigger rules and cons like constructs I don't work as well with. And I tend to feel really trapped and I want to feel more independent. So I was like, how can I fulfill my curiosity and how can I turn it into a living? How do I turn my dream of being a talk radio host and researching why people do what they do into a job? And you know, I stumbled into YouTube for a lot of reasons. First, at the encouragement of my father, who thought I would be great on YouTube, and he was right. And then on top of that, it was my own lived journey that kind of contributed to how my YouTube career ended up flourishing or in some aspects dying. You know what I mean? My mental health absolutely got me off YouTube like three times. I think I've taken myself off YouTube for like six months at a time, three months at a time. And now I'm back full force. I'm very ready. I know what I'm doing here. I know why I'm getting up every day. I know what my focus is. Um, but I know it's not to be a psychiatrist. I know it's not to be a therapist. I know it's not to go into medicine. I know it's not to be formally educated for the particular desire to be licensed. Maybe it's formally educated at some point in my life. Maybe that is a path I take. I think about that often. Like, oh, yeah, I wouldn't be totally opposed to that. Oh, my God, I'm Steve. Oh, God bless America. But that's not the same as saying like, oh, yeah, I'm going to go into this field and I'm going to research this field and this is going to be my field of interest. I'm not one of those humans. Knowing what type of human you are will change and transform your life. That's why I do not want to self-diagnose myself with autism or ADHD or anything, even though I'm willing to say like other things are obvious. And it's because I want to make sure I label myself the correct color of blue because I don't want to be somebody that's like, I'm a dark blue, but I'm a light blue. Now, that's not black and white. There are lots of things I say about myself. Remember when I was a lesbian who was dating men? Good times. Now, it could be accurate for you, but that obviously wasn't accurate for me. I'm obviously like pansexual is a much more accurate shade of blue. And maybe in the future, I'll realize like, oh, I was still off. I'm okay being wrong about my sexual orientation label. I'm less okay being wrong about like a medical issue or an issue that's going to dictate how I live my life in a very serious way, if that makes sense. So it's interesting, these lines we have for ourselves. 
This was the problem that really attracted me. And this isn't about my desire. This is sort of where we introduce a concept of dharma or duty. So I recognize that I'm lucky. I, I'm, I'm this kid who got to spend seven years studying to become a monk in India. So I travel back and forth, but I spent my summers there. So I had this really unique perspective. And then I got to train at Harvard Medical School. And what am I supposed to do with this knowledge, right? Like this is 15 years that I've devoted to understanding how human beings work. And like, I had this very kind of, you know, chic private practice in Boston where I worked with very, very successful people and helped them achieve. And then I sort of realized, like, that's not what I'm here for, right? So I've gotten 15 years to learn all of this stuff and, like, there's no short. I think that's really important, too, is he's talking about the difference between, like, okay, am I in it to work with, like, rich people or to work with, like, a more – to be more accessible to different kinds of people? And I think that's much more interesting. Like some people do just want to work with like the very popular kind of people, which I think is like within reason. And then some people want to be more community oriented. Dr. K feels much more in between where he wants to work with people that are like actually ready to get better. And at the same time, doesn't want to work with people that necessarily are just like, quote, wealthy. And that's why he's working with them. Right. Um, could a wrong self-diagnosis still be helpful if you relate to their struggles and find their coping strategies helpful to you? I think everything is helpful as long as it's helpful. Me, personally, there are just some things that are probably going to like be less helpful. So you need to pick the tool that's going to be the most helpful. Everything is like a tool to me. And so the question is, is a wrong diagnosis helpful to you. And if it is helpful, do that. If a self-diagnosis is helpful to you, do that. If a label is helpful to you, do that. As long as it's helping, use the tool. That's kind of my belief. If it's not helping, switch out the tool. Shortage of people lining up to help CEOs with their mental health. There's absolutely a shortage of people helping 25-year-old incels who are like on the internet who everyone wants to throw in jail because they're very hateful and misogynistic and things like that. So I sort of realized that like, okay, like this is what I'm supposed to do. So I'm going to do it. Okay. So I've got a big question, but before I, to, just to tee up that big question, you said you had this practice in Boston where you were working with sort of high profile individuals, et cetera. See how Steve, St Steve, Steven, what's his name? See how he like focuses on the fact that he worked with affluent people and he wants to know more about that. It's because his podcast is kind of that bubble. I saw him recently on a like a shark tank, but not a shark tank. I don't know actually what it was. And he someone was trying to sell their product to him. And he's like, I already have tons of these in my house. And they're like, yeah, but you're not our clientele. You're like a rich influencer who gets sent free stuff. And that made me forget because I forget all the time that he's not just like a YouTuber. He is a guy like in that bubble. He works with affluent people. Some of the biggest stars in the world come on his podcast. And so I have to remember that he's not just a YouTuber who gets cool guests. He's one of them. You know what I'm saying? What is the full spectrum of individuals that you've spent time working with on a one-on-one -on -one basis or through your practice? I worked with people out of MIT, incubators, CEOs, entrepreneurs, things like that. So a lot of high performance people, but then I've also worked with like losers let's say. So this is also more intensely. This is everything from 25-year-old kid who's living in his mom's basement playing video games all day to people who are even homeless. Um, so I, I worked with like basically like the whole spectrum. And yeah. You used the word losers there. And you did a little air quotes for anyone that can't see you um, right now. I'm really interested when you talked about incels as well, whether the way society is and the way that we're heading in terms of clarity over what it is to be a man has had any impact on those people that you refer to as incels like i'm, I'm you know mm -hmm. like because we now have this well. digital world that we can live our lives in as a distraction from the real world and there's now more confusion than ever over what it is to be a man and the role of a man in a you know and then we look at the stats around suicidality and i think in europe the biggest killer of men under the age of 45 is themselves currently that's crazy is the shifting That's idea insane. of what it is to be a man having an impact on people's sense of self and their purpose? A hundred percent. So mm. th there's a there's a crisis. Listen to this. This gets good. Crisis that's going on in men. And people think that this is new, but I don't think it's new. It's always been there. So if you look at like, you know, even 50, 60 years ago, 80% of suicides are still going to be men. 
So historically, men have been killing themselves for like 100 years and no one's been paying attention. We're just noticing now because the problem seems to be getting worse. Mm -hmm. So there's a couple of things that are... So his alleged net worth is 60 million pounds. Became a millionaire at 23, dropped out of university and had a marketing agency. Really interesting to understand. So one is that if we look at what technology is doing to our brains, the first thing that it's doing is it is externalizing our attention. So if you look back, like let's say a thousand years ago, as human beings, we spent a lot more time with ourselves. Yep. So let's say that you and I go out hunting. And then let's say you shoot an arrow at a deer and you miss. And then I shoot an arrow at a deer and I hit. So in this moment, I'm superior to you. And then we pick up the deer and we're carrying it back. And then we have about two or three hours to take that emotional insult. And we kind of process it. We just give our mind space to process it, which it does automatically. Now, if you look at what happens in people's days, they don't actually have any time to process what happens to them because we are so constantly distracted by external things. So I, I don't know if, if you're like this, but I was in this point where I was idiotically efficient. So I mm. would wake up in the morning and I would listen to a podcast mm -hmm. while I'm like doing my exercise or whatever. And then even when I'm cooking, I'm listening to a lecture. Mm -hmm. And then like when I'm walking to the train, I have ear, uh, you know, uh, earbuds in and I'm listening to a lecture there. On the train I'm reading, I wanted my life to be completely efficient. I didn't want to waste a single moment. I literally listen to the news in the shower. It's Right? Yeah. So we don't want to waste time. And so if you really think about mm. it. Okay. This is so interesting to me, right? This stands out to me because I, I grew up with a mom who she was stay-at-home mom. And my mom on purpose would like unplug things. She would like unplug our Nintendo and plug the TV and be like, no more technology. Go outside. And when we would go outside, it would give us our opportunity to stop listening to things and just listen to nature and listen to ourselves and be in silence. And even as a family now, we do sit in silence a lot. We'll just be outside drinking tea, acknowledging each other, maybe talking. Just like we're not, we don't feel forced to talk to one another, but we do a lot of talking. Ten kids, lots of noise in the house. Especially as adults when we come home to visit and, you know, there's grandkids and stuff involved. So obviously, you know, I grew up with a parent that does meditate via prayer. She has her moments of silence. My father, too, does moments of silence. And so there's something about that where I think people forget to do it. So in my life, I try to implement that as well. Oh, my God. My allergies suck today. Holy crap. No, oh, I feel like I'm going to sneeze again. <sighs> oh, my God. It's been bad this week. It's been really bad this week. So we, I try to do that in my life. I try to remind myself, hey, you don't need to listen to anything right now. Like just be, um, because yeah, I will just listen to things all day. And I notice myself getting really like exhausted from it. And so I tried not to reach that exhaustion point. But if I feel myself if any way getting exhausted by listening to things, I just do things in silence. You know, um, I just think that was really beneficial to me growing up with a parent that like unplugged things you know, and we weren't, we didn't have free reign to just like turn on the Nintendo or turn on a movie. We had spe specified times we watched things as a family and we were very much like we loved TV as a family. We loved like movies as a family. You know, that was never not something we did together. We just didn't always have the TV on. I have a family friend. Oh my God. They always have all three TVs, TVs in their house on all the time. All of the time. When I'm there, if you go into different parts of the house, there's a TV on. And I'm like, nobody's home. One time I sat in silence. I was like on my phone and I turned off the TV because they were going to leave and I was at their house. And they're like, oh, you don't want the TV on? And I was like, well, I'm not watching it. They're like, oh, you don't want it on? And I was like, I'm, I'm not watching it. I'm not going to have something on that I'm not focusing on or paying attention to. Even in the background, if I have something on in the background, it means I'm paying attention to it. Right? So I So no, I don't want it on. I'm not paying I don't want to pay attention to it. Interesting. Very interesting, but for them it was comforting. That way when they go to each room there's something to I don't know. People are different.
Where's the attention of your mind? Your mind is pointed outside of you. And so then what happens is once we do not pay attention to ourselves, we lose sight of our internal signals. Literally in the same way that if you raise a child in a dark cave, the, the photoreceptors in their eyes won't develop. They will atrophy. So any t anything that the mind does not get access to will start to atrophy. If I don't practice Spanish, I'm going to forget Spanish. The mind is very, brain is a very efficient organ. So as we externalize our attention, we lose sight of our internal signals. We don't know who we are anymore. And now if I don't know who I am, how do I figure out who I'm supposed to be? I pay attention to the outside. Where are the mm -hmm. answers? They're on the outside. Mm -hmm. So this person is talking about masculinity. This person is talking about what it means to be a man. This person is talking about what it means to be a man. And now since I don't have any internal source of information, I'm trying to figure out what it means to be a man from the outside world. And this is when men get truly fucked because what it means to be a man, we are getting all kinds of mixed signals. So on the one hand, it means being physically fit. On the other hand, it means being a provider. On one hand, it means having sex with as many women as you can find. On the other hand, it means having sex with um, just one woman and being a really solid man and being a good father. And then there's also people telling us that being a man means that you're shit, right? That you're toxic, that your testosterone level makes you violent, that you're evil, that you're mm -hmm. privileged, that there's a patriarchy, all this kind of stuff. So we're, we're getting all this information from the outside about what it means to be a man. Mm -hmm. And so the other, like, there are all kinds of interesting ramifications of this. So men in today's society are not allowed to complain. So if you complain and you're a successful person or a privileged person, everyone is going to think you're arrogant. Everyone is going to think, oh, my God, who's this fucking guy? This guy doesn't know what my life is like. How does he have any right to complain? And even your mind will tell you this. You'll look at these people and you'll be like, yeah, I don't have a right to complain. But now we need to stop for a second and think about what it does to your psychology when you as a human being are not allowed to articulate your suffering. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And this is what I was trying to say about Hassan and I do stand by, though I do understand and agree with Abba and agree with everyone why it's upsetting to hear Hassan express himself, which is why when Abba asked me, like if the rich man choked on like, what did he say? What was it? Veal or something that he spent money on? And would you feel just as bad for him as the guy who got hit by a car? Yes, because all suffering is suffering is suffering. Yeah, of course, I feel a way about that, right? So, yes, of course, I feel like the suffering is the same. And you remember how Abba laughed? He's like, really? I was like, yes. Like, yeah, like that's how I feel about it. I feel just as bad for the rich man that suffers that I do as the poor man who suffers. Suffering is suffering is suffering. But also, I understand and agree with you why it is hard to connect with people's suffering. And I think that that makes sense to me as well. I don't always relate to everyone's suffering. You know what I mean? So I totally get it. Oh, my God. The chat and we were talking about. Yes, the chat is saying it's Hassan. He's talking about Hassan. Yes, yes, yes. OK, we're all in the same wa wavelength here. But yeah, it's like that. And that's a very specific philosophy idea about the world. Also, we're not going to we might not watch the segment today, but there's a segment in here about meditation. Maybe we'll watch it. I don't know. There's a segment in here about meditation. And he talks about how he taught his babies to meditate at a young age, even as young as two years old. And I really recommend this for parents. If you feel overwhelmed by the noise your kids are creating, like teaching them that silence is a gift was a gift my mother gave me. Being silent, being calm, being with nature, going outside, like exp not outside on the street, like outside in the backyard if you have one or in a space where you can be silent. It is such a gift to give a child and to give yourself as the parent, girl. You, let me tell you, overstimulation as a parent, you know what I mean? Give your kids the gift of silence. Often what parents give their gift, their kids is the burden of technology, is the burden of noises. Often parents will give their kids something loud and distracting in order to get a moment of silence for themselves. Give your kids the gift of silence. And again, I'm not a parent. I'm just an auntie. I was a professional nanny and I've worked with kids my whole life. This is what I've seen works for me as a child of a parent who gave me that gift. I'm not saying that I know better than you because I know you're the parent. I'm just saying, for me, as a child of a parent who gave me silence as a gift, it has benefited my life as I've aged. I've worked with people who have grown up in abusive households where children will say to their parents, mommy, daddy, I'm hurting. And the, the parent smacks them across the face. How dare you? You're so lucky. You don't realize the sacrifices I make for you. It's traumatizing. Mm -hmm. To the child, when mm -hmm. they say, I am suffering and no one listens. By the way, you know how I know Hassan really suffers too? It's not just because he has an eating disorder, but I saw a picture of his mom and his brother and him the other day, and I was like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 
Everyone grows up dysfunctional. Hassan was not able to become one of the biggest streamers without enough dysfunction. You have to be a certain level of dysfunctional to become a very popular streamer. No doubt. Remember that. This is what we're doing to the generation of men. Mm. People are saying, I am suffering. For 100 years, men have been killing themselves. 80% of suicides are men. That's crazy. The most dangerous thing for a man under 45 is themselves. Ooh. And these people have been literally killing themselves because no one has been listening to them. Damn. So in the same way that you grow up with a, 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 as a child in a household that's abusive where no one takes you seriously, no one listens to your suffering, and now we even have successful men who are not allowed to complain. Mm -hmm. So the psychological impact is the same. Anytime you have a human being who is suffering in some way and they cannot find connection with another human being, they cannot find compassion with another human being, that person is going to feel isolated. And if you look at the statistics on suicide, it's very interesting. So the number one thing that correlates with male suicide is not depression. And this is super scary. There's one study I saw recently that suggests that 50% of men who kill themselves have no history or evidence of mental illness. Mm -hmm. And this, I, I believe the statistic in, in my clinical practice because I know what depression looks like. I know what bipolar disorder looks like. And half the men that I've worked with at least are not actually mentally ill. Mm -hmm. See, mental illness means a pathology of the mind, which mm -hmm. means that the mind is malfunctioning. Most of the suicidal men that I work with, they're not Mal their mind isn't malfunctioning. They genuinely have a life that is no longer worth living. They're looking at things and objectively realizing that there's no way out of this situation. So they turn to suicide. So I know it's kind of like a very controversial statement, but I think that's what my clinical practice has shown. And there's some research to even back that up. I would use a different language than Dr. K did just here, but I would say similarly, I don't think all people who choose suicide choose it because they have a mental illness so much as choose it because they feel like there's no other way out. And I don't think it's always objective like he said. I would argue that it most likely is subjective. And I think he goes on to clarify in a way that I think I would agree with. I don't think all people, and then I think there's some people that choose death and they're ready to die. And there's definitely like nothing you could give them that could change their mind because they're just ready to die. So I think there's three categories, people that are definitely ready to die, people that feel trapped so they have to kill themselves because they don't know what else to do, right? And then people that suffer from psychosis or bipolar or some sort of like mental snap in their brain that makes them kill themselves because the sober version of their brain couldn't communicate. So for these men who are high on the statistical list, that he's 50% of them, I think he is talking about people that feel like, okay, there's nothing else I can do. I have to kill myself, which is where I think introspection plays a role. I feel like this, this was me. I feel like I never wanted to die. I felt like I felt like dying would relieve so much of my suffering. And every time I asked for the world to like understand my suffering, they told me it never mattered. So I was like, okay, well, if the world doesn't care about my suffering and even my friends, close, like close friends and family didn't know how to care for my suffering in a way that made sense to me, like what was the point? And then I did some introspection work and realized like I care about my suffering and that's all I needed. I needed me to care. Yes, I needed validation along the way. Yes, I needed like some sort of tool to get to the next step. But ultimately, all of my journey led to me realizing like I was the only person I ever needed to care about my suffering, to alleviate my suffering. It took me a really long time to realize that. In middle of my suffering, right, I sought out validation from people and I got it in a lot of circles, a lot of progressive mentally health circles, like a lot of progressive circles validated my mental health, but they did it in anger and they did it as a resentment of the way I was raised and they hated my parents, but I didn't want to hate my parents for the rest of my life. I didn't want to blame my parents. I wanted something more forgiving and something more freeing than the burden of hating my parents. So though they validated my illnesses and that felt really good, they made me, they gave me a different kind of burden I didn't want anymore, which was like to continue hating my parents. So after I got therapy and then after I went on my philosophy journey and after I went on my introspection journey, I realized like, okay, I needed to let go of the resentment and bitterness I had for other people's own journey. And I needed to recognize like they are me on a journey just like I am. And they're going to struggle the same way I am. And they're going to hold on to bitterness too. And my job is to be the kind of person that I think is a, a good person, but more than a good person, a free person, a person without the burden of bitterness and without the burden of hate, because I could control that. I could decide eventually to truly let go of the attachment 
of like bitterness and hate. Like I would be more than happy to admit to you if I hate someone, there is content I've made of when I have hated people and I have hated people. But once I let go of the burden of hating those people, I realized like, oh, that makes so much more sense. But I couldn't do it until I actually fully let it go, which is the thing that took so much time, right? Is the thing that took so much time. It wasn't something I just thought like once I decided to like I don't hate anyone anymore. Therefore, I don't No, It wasn't a matter of me. It was first I had to say, I think I want to stop hating people. Oh, my God. Whoa. I used to love my hate. I used to like and when I say hate people, I mean people that I think did wrong. Hate hate meaning people that did me wrong, not like random people. I've never hated people for just being people. I've always hated that people were cruel to people or people were horrible or lied or did like I hated people for what they did, not just being a person. And once I let go of that resentment and that hatred, I learned like people are just doing people things in the way that the bear does bear things. And being mad at the bear is just as efficient as being mad at the person. And there's just no efficiency to, towards it. It doesn't get me happier. It doesn't make me more joyful. It doesn't make me feel peaceful. It makes me feel heavy and burdened. And I'm trying to be light and flowy like a bird. I want to be a butterfly. Okay? So again, for me, the way I stopped wanting to unalive myself was a process of letting go of so many burdens that I decided to carry. Because of my journey, which makes so much sense. Throughout life, you collect things. I decided, again, Maria Kondo, get rid of everything that doesn't bring you peace or happiness or spark joy, whatever she says. Get rid of it and keep only the things. You know what I mean? So I've always wanted to live because I like living. I just don't like living with other people. And I don't like living with ideology. And I don't like living with people that are unpeaceful. And I don't like living like the world's a little too chaotic for me. I thrive in the chaos. But I also am exhausted by it. So I like my life. I like my bubble. I don't, when I want to stop living, it's when I'm interacting with other people's bubbles a lot of the time because their bubbles are like basically hell on earth to me. So for me, I go back into my bubble because like when I'm with other people's, I'm like, oh, girl, you're a little too toxic for me, girl. Little too, this is making me want to, this is, I don't want to carry this burden. You know what I'm saying? So that's my personal journey. I really feel like I had to realize I never wanted to die. I just didn't want to live with you. I just don't want to live with you. I never wanted to die, though. I just don't want to live with you. So if we sort of look at what's going on with men, we're sort of, they have nowhere to turn to. And the number one thing that correlates with it is not mental illness, but is a sense of thwarted belongingness. So this is kind of like fact uh, multivariate regression analysis. But basically what happens is what causes people to kill themselves is they try to connect with others and they get rejected. So it's specifically mm. a, a very specific research term called thwarted belongingness. So I try to belong to a group mm -hmm. and that group or multiple groups usually will, will thwart my attempts to join the tribe, to yep. join the community. And this is what actually correlates a lot with suicidality. Yep. So what's going on with men right now is that we really don't allow them to suffer you know, because then you're not manly. And we're so externalized with our attention that we're not connecting with ourselves. And so we're looking to other people to tell us what it means to be a man. This was my bubble hopping experience in my 20s and throughout my teens, trying to figure out where do I fit? What's the bubble? Who will tell me what it is to be a Britney? Oh, me, dummy. I kept thinking it was other people. Um, Caitlin says, what's it called when you love life, but you also desperately need a break from existence? Is that burnout? Yeah, it sounds like burnout, girl. That's me, girl. Burnout is not me. That's my idea about existence and existing. Existing is here. Existence is out there. It is exhausting dealing with existence. I personally love this part. Like you guys are my existence and I love that. Okay. But there is like burnout, not because of you guys mostly, it's it would be mostly because of, you know, when there's stuff that's like intensely happening on the internet. Um, you know what I mean? But yeah, like you are burnt out and that's fine. It is fine to be burnt out by existence. It's fine to say like, dude, I just want to go back to my existing. I want to go back to my little bubble. I want to do my little thing. I just remember being a nanny and, you know, I'm making like, uh, I don't know how much, maybe less than 30K. And I'm nannying five kids and it's a really good gig. And I'm also working YouTube. So I have two jobs that make about 30K. 
And I remember thinking I was on my period and I just remember thinking like, I just want to be able to be home on my period because working on my period sucks. I just hate doing it into my 30s. It got worse and worse. My 20s was fine, but my 30s was really bad. And that was kind of my thing is I told myself, I want to be able to tell existence, thank you. I'm going to take a break from you right now. And so I work every day, as many hours a day as it takes to make sure that I never have to work on my period again, even though what that really means is outside of my home. Because obviously I still work on my period. I just work from home. So it's really what that meant. It didn't mean not work at all. It just meant like not work outside of the home. I don't want to get into my car and drive in the snow to a job on my period and have to be standing all day and have to be in a good mood all day. Like at least here I can come on stream and be like, oh, I'm on my period. I hate everyone. Everyone's getting beat up today. You know what I'm saying? That is why I work every day as many hours as it takes. I don't care if it takes 20. I don't care if it takes 15. I'm not driving in the snow to a job to work on my period. Sounds horrible, you know, but that's again, we all have our own little reasons why, but there's always a reason why. Why do we choose our jobs? Why do we choose our life? Why do things end up the way they do? And figuring out why is really the key. If you think you figured out the why, but you're not any more joyful, you haven't found out the real reason. Keep asking yourself. Amy says, how do you stop hating people you who you feel aren't just regular people living their lives, but you feel are narcissistic sociopaths by radically accepting their narcissistic sociopaths? What a burden. How happy I am that I'm not them. How happy I am that that is not my life. How sad for them. Not in a pity way. I mean, literally how difficult. How difficult for them to be victims of their own psychology, biology, and life. How difficult. Oh my God. Today's been insane. Today's, my allergies have been crazy the last three days. Think about that. Think about how grateful you are that you're not a narcissistic sociopath. What a blessing. What a reason to wake up happy every day. That alone. And how sad for them. My heart goes out to them. I would not want that life. I wouldn't wish that life on my worst enemy. I have no enemies, but if I had an enemy, I wouldn't wish it on them. They are on a journey and they collided with yours. So that narcissistic sociopath who's walking along and you're walking along and you guys meet up, that's just a moment in time. Let go of the moment and stop living in it. For as long as you hold on to that hatred for that sociopath, narcissist, whatever, you are holding on to the moment. Life is little moments of time and the moment can last five seconds or your whole lifetime. For as long as you hold on to that hatred you have or that burden of pain you feel for that person when you think of them, you are holding on and making the moment longer. Now, you can't just think, okay, I'm going to let it go. You have to practice letting it go until one day you wake up and you've truly, absolutely let go of the attachment you have to the moment. It will take time. It always does. Alex says, this sounds similar to my concept of road rage. Instead of getting mad, I have more of a reason. Oh, buddy, are you running late? Having a bad day type reaction? Mm. I'm definitely a yeller in my car, but I also don't ever want to interact with someone in a negative way. But yeah, it's like, oh, I don't know what's going on in your life right now, but bro, I'm pissed at you. But yeah, everyone's just going through things. It's why when you cut off people in traffic, you're like, eh, it's okay. But when other people cut you off, you're like, what the fuck? They're just you on a different day, you know? Um, Kyle says, Brittany, have you seen Everything Everywhere All at Once? It's similar to that. Yes, I love that movie. I own that movie. When that movie came out, people were like, Brittany, this is your levels. Brittany, this I think it's a really good representation of what I think about when I think about the levels. But yeah, when that movie came out, people were writing me like, oh my God, this movie is your levels. Like, it's, 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 I cried watching it in the theaters for sure. It was great. Um, Anecdotic, I don't want to say your name. You don't forgive someone like that. You just have an understanding of their own miserable ways and feel apathetic to how they feel for you. Um, I think that's a little shallow for me. You do forgive them. You forgive them for being humans and you forgive yourself for not radically accepting that they're human. You forgive them for being a human. Like you forgive the bear who slaughtered your whole family. And you forgive yourself for being upset that the, you don't, a bear that slaughters your whole family doesn't deserve for you to massacre it with evil in your heart. But you are allowed to be in self-defense and you're allowed to kill the bear out of a desire to live. 
Killing the bear that massacred your whole family from a place of hatred in your heart is not the goal. The goal is to put the bear down with the dignity of understanding that it is only doing what bears do. When we forgive people that have hurt us in the worst way, we are accepting and forgiving them for being human or forgiving ourselves for forgetting that they're not human. And then we are accepting that they are human, but you cannot seek revenge. You cannot be bitter. You cannot justify, oh, I would slaughter this person for slaughtering my family. Okay, but you are also now a slaughterer. Self-defense is not intentionally doing something out of evil or doing something out of bitterness. Self-defense is doing something out of fear. In the moment, I want to live another day. Doing things out of self-defense is saying, I want to live another day. Slaughtering people, revenge is saying, I am now a person who has such hatred in my heart. I will seek out evil in order to be furthest from joy. Lakara says, uh, is revenge ever justified? No. 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 I don't think so. But that may or may not work for you, right? That may have been what worked for them. So then we kind of get into this problem where we're disconnected from ourselves. And then like the world doesn't accept us. We're not allowed to suffer. And that's what creates the problem. What is the remedy to this? So I think the first thing is we must reconnect with ourselves. Right. So when you're kind of saying like, why do, does everyone. By the way, Halian says can't be angry at the bear for being a bear. You're not exactly. You're not angry at the bear for being a bear. You're angry at the frustration. You can be angry at the situation. You can be angry that you feel powerless. You can feel upset, but you can't be angry at the bear for being a bear. One think, oh, I, I need to like achieve this. I need to make this money and things like that. Where did you learn that you should do all that? You learned all that from the outside. Instagram. <clears throat> Instagram, right? So we get. Justice is revenge. Uh, justice is revenge isn't. It depends on why or how. I don't think real justice comes from a place of bitterness, hate, or resentment. We get fed all of these ideas because if you look at all these influencers, what are they doing? They're never crying. They're smiling. Some of them will even pay very attractive women to take pictures with them. Well, some right? of them are crying, but they're crying and uploading it for mm -hmm. ulterior motives, right? Absolutely. And I think a lot of them are genuinely suffering too. But then it's it's also like, I mean, there's all kinds of weird stuff going on. So one thing is like people say that men, is men we don't allow men to be emotional. Nowadays, but people say, people say, oh, men are allowed to cry. So this is something that I experience even in my marriage where we allow men to cry, but we don't allow men to be angry. But why is it are men no longer allowed to be angry? You just think about it first. Ooh, in my household, because we're Middle Eastern people, we were allowed to be angry. We were allowed to be sad. We were allowed to express ourselves. We were discouraged from being pussy, which, you know, growing up in a bully kind of mentality there, slightly, I would say better than some, worse than others. But we were allowed to be angry. And we were allowed to express that anger. We were allowed to express our emotions a lot growing up. And we were allowed to use our body to express that emotion. Like I waved my hands. We were allowed to wave our hands. But I do think that we also never had ill intentions for each other. We never ever had to worry about like a case of domestic violence. We grew up in an environment where we all wanted the best for each other, even if we were angry with each other, which I think is different. Often when people are afraid of men being angry, they're afraid of men having bad intentions with that anger or women or anyone having bad intentions with that anger. I feel like my family was angry because they were expressing an internalized feeling for themselves and they were angry, but they weren't like, I didn't ever feel like that anger was about me or it was about like a malicious intent towards me. I felt like they were angry and they were saying something about themselves you know, even when my dad was angry or like my mom was angry, it felt like they would make it about us, but I never really felt like it was about us. I mean, it did as a kid, but as I got older, I realized like, this isn't about me because I know when I'm angry, I'm like, it's not even about you. I'm just angry. You're not like, I can't get my words out. And I'm angry. You're not letting me like express that you're frustrating me, but you are frustrating me. And like, they would think it's a combination of how you express that anger. You know, even if you hit things or throw things or like yell at people, there's, I never felt physically afraid for myself, even in moments of like physicality, even when I was hit, even when I was jumped, even when, you know, there was a fear, like there was a physical element to the fights. It never really felt like I was going to die. It felt like they were just out of control in a way that was like annoying. So it's like different. It's like a different feeling. 
Um, the only time I've ever actually felt like physically afraid for myself was during my assault. Like physically, physically, like truly in the moment. That is the only time I've really felt that like that sharp of a feeling where I was like, oh my God, like, you know what I mean? Like what's happened? I've been in like scary situations, but never, never enough. You know what I mean? There's like a spectrum. What co Again, going back to the color chart, it's like there's all, all colors of blue that represents some scary relationship with anger, but the relationship is specific. So I've dealt with anger my whole life. I've had my, well, up until recently, obviously, my family's been very angry, but the way we express anger is just like a much more tolerable color of blue than how I see other people expressing anger. Some people express anger in a way that I do not like. It does not feel like predictable. It feels violent. It feels scary. It feels like I'm going to call 911. I've never felt the need to call 911 with my family. Like they're just like their anger isn't that scary. You know what I mean? But it could be to somebody else witnessing it for sure. You know what I mean? Just depends on what you're used to. Um, Haley says, is there such a thing as justice, though? It's so subjective. Eye for an eye, life sentence, death. It's a giant gray area. We obviously do our best, but it's a hard to define. I don't think humans are great at justice. I think humans are very bad at knowing what's just like what is justice, you know? Have I seen Brother Bear? Yes, I have. Long time ago. Uh, like a long time ago. But yeah, I've seen it. I've seen it, you know. Second. So anger is just a completely normal emotion, right? But if I'm in a situation where I'm in an argument with my- I also will point this out about Dr. K's work is he's often never talking about the worst kinds of people in terms of scariness. He is talking about normal displays of anger. He's not talking about anger where you choke your kid and you kill it when it's five years old, right? I think I've seen this pattern with his work that I don't think anyone says out loud. But he is, even when he says losers, he mentions incels. He's not even mentioning people with records or something. He might mean that, but he's not expressing it. And when people say, I'm afraid of angry men, they're not talking about people who just have anger issues. They're talking about people who might kill them. So again, we have to be aware of like, what kind of a group is he imagining when he talks about anger? And who are you imagining when he talks about anger? Because when he's talking, I know enough of his work to think he is not talking about people and I'm not talking about people that like you're afraid will stab you in the middle of the night because they're so angry, right? That's a very specific category of person and that is not what we're talking about. But a lot of the time when women talk about they're afraid of angry men, they're not afraid of men for being angry. They're afraid of men who are angry who might stab or kill them since partner violence is a high statistic for women's death. So men kill themselves and they kill their partners. So just a, like just a note, when women are afraid of violent men they're, or angry men, they're also afraid of violent men, right? It's much scarier to watch testosterone flail itself around a room than estrogen. And that is why we have the stereotype that when women are violent, it lets, it's less scary than when men are violent because testosterone is a much more violent sense of power than estrogen. I... My part, my partner and I play fight pretty often and no matter how tough I am, no matter how strong I feel, this gamer boy could murder me if he wanted to. And that my 13 year old brother was stronger than me. By the time I was an adult and he was a teenager, he could have killed me like literally. And so again, like I've heard from men. I remember we had a medical emergency in the house one time and we needed to hold down one of my siblings. Um, and they were like young and act. it was anyways. And we needed to hold them down and they had me do it. Me like do it because they're like, we'll, we'll accidentally like we might hurt them because we're so strong. We have so much testosterone that like you need to do this. And so like I was the one who held down my sibling because with all of my strength, I would not be able to break my siblings like bones. I would not be able to hurt them. But my farm brother is so strong. He will grab my wrist and I'm like, geez, I, he could snap my arm. He's so strong. I'm not even exaggerating. Like how, when I look at him, I was like, damn, you could just kill somebody, bro. I couldn't do that. No matter how strong I am, I'm never going to be able to snap your arm the way he could snap my arm. It's insane. It's a, it's a, it's a very scary experience if you, if you don't understand how powerful it is. So I think we're not just afraid of angry men for no reason. But also, since women are able to express anger because they're not as threatening to people, though, of course, they can be, the men are missing out on an opportunity to be angry, which again goes back to my upbringing. And I will say for all of the faults of my childhood, at least we were able to express our anger. 
We just were. You know how many times my siblings and I have like left the house slamming doors? That's anger. That's an expression of anger. Better for you to slam the door than slam someone's head into the concrete. My wife. And I feel emotion A. And I express emotion A. And she feels emotion B. And she expresses emotion B. These two things should be equal, right? We as both human beings get to express what we feel. Now, in the case of me expressing anger and her expressing sadness, she's crying and I'm yelling. Suddenly, I've become a villain. It's so interesting. I saw a viral tweet yesterday. It was someone Googling, my wife is yelling at me, what should I do? And then my husband is yelling at me, what should I do? When they Googled, my husband is yelling at me, what should I do? Domestic violence helpline comes up as like a Google um, uh, pop-up. Mm -hmm. When you Google, my wife is yelling at me, what should I do? Nothing comes up. Yeah. Because obviously, as you said, in the case of villainization, I know that most domestic violence comes from men but it's it's interesting that we see the emotion we interpret the emotions entirely differently because of that absolutely right so we as a society will say like oh men men need to be in touch with their emotions but not anger and then this is what really yeah i will say a lot of this is you know it's no one's again i don't want to blame anyone but i will say humans unless you're introspective enough to let go of the constructs I really do think you have to find a construct that gives you a chance to like figure yourself out. So Dr. K is trying to give them the tool within the construct to like tackle their own feelings and how society has neglected them. Men. My work is more focused on the individual outside of the construct to the best of my ability who's trying to say you cannot keep pointing to the con because if you're in a construct with toxic masculinity, then men are the reason that men aren't able to express their anger. It was never about women because women have been trained by men in so many ways to to have an expectation of what a real man is because men have decided what real men are. But in another bubble, and again, I don't want to point blame like that. So instead, I would just say, what do you as an individual, what kind of relationship do you want with your life? Because if we start pointing at who raised me this way, it was probably a man. And it was probably a woman that was subservient to a man. You know what I mean? Because the only toxic masculinity bubbles that encourage this sort of gender dynamic are going to have male-led homes. And even the ones that are female-led, like, they're going to be... That's why they say boys raised by women are different. But, like, what women? What kind of sisters and aunties do you have around you? What's the... Exp A lot of men who are raised by women are considered feminine men. But then at the same time, there's a lot of lacking of father figures in men's lives when they are raised primarily by women if the women themselves are struggling with their own burdens. So again, instead of pointing fingers, though it should be, it would be good to know what bubble you're in in terms of that. Which trope are you? Are you the guy who was raised by women and ended up being perfect and made you a gentleman and you're like, like you have a good job and good relationships? Are you the bubble of men who were raised by women and you really needed a father figure and you never had one? Because it's not black and white. You don't necessarily need a father figure, but you don't, Obviously, you won't have a full rounded understanding of humanity if you don't have some sort of lots of like figures in your life. Like I was really lucky. I had multiple parental figures in my life. I had lots of aunties and uncles. I had lots of like male mentors and female mentors. I had a lot of really positive role models in my life, not just my parents. So again, I, I think Dr. K is trying to give a really good tool to the construct, like somebody in the construct. I don't usually work with these kinds of people. I work with some men that are similar, but I usually don't end up working with a lot of men unless they have a few progressive ideas already. Because again, like outside of political terms, progressive, I just mean like in a more modern sense, because I can't start from scratch with somebody that in no way, shape or form has any idea that they have to stop blaming the world. So I usually try to work with people who've already gotten past the blame game in some aspect and they know it's like them. They have to work on themselves. Dr. K is a really good person to start you off if you're still blaming the world. Does that make sense? That's why like I focus on philosophy and he integrates philosophy into his therapy. But like therapy would help you get over that initial stage. That's why I say come to me after therapy because I'm not therapy. I can't help you stop doing the blame game. I can only like work with you after you've done you're done blaming the world for your like, you know, issues really screws men. Because as men, we are socialized and conditioned to only feel anger. This is the only emotion. Ooh, wait, wait, wait. Lexi says, I just don't think we should be yelling at people we love no matter what gender or 
uh, we are. Yelling doesn't feel like a healthy expression of anger to me. Yelling into the void for sure, but not at people. Mm. Yeah, I think there's a difference between like, I don't mind yelling because raising your voice and yelling is like an expression. And I don't think I want to stop people from yelling, but I don't want people like, you know, using certain language, derogatory speak. I don't mind people speaking louder to be heard. It depends, but I think we shouldn't be degrading people if we're having an honest conversation. So I agree with you on that. Like, I don't want the people I love in my life to feel like I'm not like seeing their humanity, but I want to make sure as well that like yelling isn't going to make me turn away from you unless because like again, some people aren't ready to have a regulation with their emotions. I think you're right. That's probably not the healthiest, but it also is just like, again, I don't want to Dr. K is saying it again. We want people to have it a relationship with their emotions, but not all of them. Yelling is a part of like an emotion. It's saying, I don't feel heard and I need you to hear me. It's it's a like, that's why I validate like a form of raising your voice and yelling. But if yelling, but to me, yelling is different than, than demeaning or tearing someone apart or being angry or bitter or dehumanizing. Like that's very different. But if you're just being loud, because like you're having a hard time even speaking. So yelling is actually the method in which you are heard. I don't mind yelling. What I don't like is that yelling plus demeaning language plus physicality plus insults plus, you know what I mean? Lesky says, maybe I was thinking of yelling. I'm thinking about that violent screaming that accompanies abuse often. Maybe raising your voice is a different thing. Yes, I agree with you. We don't want that. We don't want the abuse. We don't want the hate. We don't want that, any of that stuff. Uh, yeah. Wolf says, that's very true. Anger is really the only emotion us men are allowed to have. Any other emotion is seen as weakness. Even when someone dies, it's seen as kind of bad because us men aren't supposed to show emotion other than anger. Mm -hmm. That's definitely a stereotype in a lot of parts of the world. Not universally, but yeah, especially in the West. Emotion you are allowed to feel as a man growing up. And this is the one emotion that gets demonized when you're older. So I'll give you a simple example. So like I used to get bullied a lot, right? So when I get bullied in school, like what am I supposed to do, Stephen? In school? Well, it depends if you can fight back. Absolutely, right? It's fighting back. Like you didn't say talk to the teacher. You didn't say ask for help. You didn't say cry about- So obviously he's talking about a very specific bubble, right? This is not a universal experience. This is- only an experience of a very particular bubble he's talking about. This is not a universal experience, but it will resonate with enough people. Because if I cry about it, what's going to happen, Stephen? You're going to get bullied more. Absolutely. So we turn every emotion. So men experience anger is something called an umbrella emotion. We literally suppress and are conditioned to suppress all <laughs> other emotions except for anger. And then if you talk to men about their experience of life, anger is always the first thing that comes out of their mouth. Someone breaks up with you. How do you feel about it? Do you feel ashamed? No, that's not what we say. I feel pissed off. How could she do this to me? And then we vent that anger on the internet, and then this turns into misogyny, right? And then we get demonized for it. And it's not that there isn't... Uh, it, we should be harshly judged if we act on those kinds of emotions. I'm not saying that that's the case. But what we also need to consider is that the men who are saying these kinds of toxic things are saying that for a reason. This is because of their upbringing. This is because- Exactly. Caitlin says, yelling for control to establish power is not great. I think I agree with you, 100. That's the toxic kind of yelling that's not allowed. You cannot yell to control the conversation. You can yell to represent yourself. You can yell if you feel like you're not being heard and then we will pause and recontextualize. You know what I mean? But we will, We but to control, to abuse- to do any of that, not okay, right? Like not okay to yell. I don't mind yelling as long as it's meant to be like, I need to be heard and I feel like I'm not being heard. I don't mind you raising your voice, but you cannot do it to control the situation. You cannot do it to abuse. You cannot do it to manipulate. That is not allowed, right? And that's absolutely a tactic some people will use, right? Absolutely. Um, Let me see. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. what's wrong with feeling bitter? It's ugly. It's a burden. It's not unethical. Well, it can be if you turn it into something. Bitterness often turns ugly. Bitterness is obvious, like it's an ugliness in a human. In my, in my world, if you're bitter, name a bitter person that is great to be around. Name a bitter person that's happy. Name a person who carries bitterness in them that doesn't look ugly when they're talking about the thing they're bitter about. 
People's faces literally twist when they're being bitter. Because of the world that they lived in, right? So we're conditioned to only experience anger. Even sadness gets turned into anger. Shame gets turned into anger. Fear gets- And also growing up in a house of 10 kids, you kind of had to yell to get attention. So just like FYI. Yes, Bryson, bad for your skin. Turned into anger, right? So if I'm afraid of something happening, what do I need? I need man up. Get angry, right? Like, let's go, son. Let's go. This is the emotion that we tap into to overcome fear. So we don't feel any of those other emotions and we're left only feeling anger. At the very heart of aggression, um, I had someone say to me once that at the very heart of aggression is some kind of insecurity. But for men, when they encounter that insecurity, they only know how to sort of manifest it as aggression. So I wouldn't agree with the first thing that at the heart of all anger is insecurity, but I would absolutely agree with the second thing that the way that we, the only way we know how to respond is with anger. Because so Here's the exact quote, just found it. The source of aggression is insecurity. As we are unconsciously aware that our position in life is never secure, people feel in increasingly insecure and helpless. So they will be increasingly aggressive and confrontational at a personal and a social level. So let's tunnel down into that for a second. Okay, so I think that that is true on some level, but also I would disagree. So the first thing is that we have parts of our brain, even animals feel anger. But I think that like when two dogs are fighting over territory, I don't think that that's born of some kind of identity of insecurity, right? So if we really look at like the evolutionary mm -hmm. purpose of anger, this is my opinion, is that anger is the emotion that we feel to protect our territory. It's a protective emotion. So if I- I, I agree with this slap you across the face, what's the first thing that you're going to feel? It's going to be anger. So if I insult you, you're going to feel angry. It, it's fascinating the way that it works. So anger causes our thoughts to be faster. Anger causes our peripheral vision to collapse to 30 degrees. Mm -hmm. So I only see what's in front of me. Mm -hmm. And it also makes me less uh, sensitive to pain. So like my nociceptors will actually like- Oh, girl. Oh, girl start to be suppressed Let when I feel you. angry, right? Mm. So if I get into a fight, I'm going to feel it tomorrow. But like while I'm getting hit, I'm not going to feel it. So my anger throughout all of my childhood was a survival mechanism. I used my anger to survive. I absolutely relied on my anger like Vegeta, Prince of All Saiyans, R.I.P. to Toriyama to guide me and keep me alive during my survival years. One thousand billion million trillion saiyan princes so true for me my anger was my greatest survival tool and when i learned to live and i no longer needed to survive in that way i let go of my anger it was no longer useful to me but damn she kept me alive my anger absolutely kept me working kept me paying rent kept me functioning kept me socializing my anger and bitterness, okay, kept me alive. My bitterness less so. My bitterness made me really, really ugly. It did. My bitterness as a person personally made me very ugly. I wasn't fun to be around when I was bitter. I wasn't fun at parties. But my anger was when I brought it out like a weapon. But they did, in conjunction, keep me alive long enough to move together. Long enough to let go of my bitterness before I let go of my anger. Yeah. Yeah. My anger has definitely kept me alive. Mm. So I don't think it's born of all insecurity. I think anger is simply an evolutionary response. It, it's, it's something that we experience to protect ourselves. That's why we feel angry, right? So if I attack baby bear, mama bear is going to come out angry. So it's, it's really a protective emotion. Now, mm -hmm. I agree with the second part of the statement 100% that when we feel insecure, especially as men, the only way we are taught to deal with our problems is through anger. Right? So if I'm feeling insecure, if I'm feeling ashamed of myself, if someone's bullying me, what do I do? I put them in their place. Mm. Right? I don't try to make peace. I don't complain to someone because no one's going to take me seriously. Right? I have to stand up for myself. So we've got the first point there about how we remedy this challenge, which is about self-expression, more self-expression. That's what I heard. Not self-expression. Introspection. Interesting. Ooh, 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 ooh. This is it. This is it. Not self-expression. Introspection. Progressives conservatives, all, every human is so just consumed with identity, self-expression, but not introspection identity. Identity for introspection's sake 
is the goal. Identity for self-expression's sake is, is good, but is not the goal. That is the consequence of the internal, okay? Your expression physically is a manifestation of what's happening internally. And it's about how you process external and internal. The goal is not self-expression. That's shallow. The goal is introspection. That's the depth. Introspection, getting to know ourselves. Right? So so it's very simple. So if you look at your idea of what it means to be a man, what percentage of that idea comes outside of you? (laughs) And what percentage of that idea comes from within you? About 90% comes from outside of me. And that's why 90% of people, we're 90% fucked. Right. So and if you look and I'm sure you know this and you've probably done this, too, if you look at where is the goodness in your life, where does it come from, Stephen? It doesn't come from what other people have told you. They may have told you something, but then you looked within yourself and then you found that to be true. Yeah, literally. Okay, Monet said it: identity in isolation versus identity in society, which is why when I do introspective work with people with callers, I do this like thought exercise where I put you in like an environment all by yourself And then I ask you like a group of questions and I give you some homework and we try to figure out like what we're figuring out is like, who are you in isolation? Who are you in isolation? Who are you in your existing not in relation to existence? I want to know who you really are. So when I say Sneeko isn't who he's saying he is, when I say people aren't who they say they are, I'm saying they are not who they are in relation to existence, which is us. I want to know who they are when they're alone. I want to know who they are when they're in isolation. And more than just being alone, who are they in their most internal depth? Who are they in their deepest, most known self? I've done this exercise with people and they don't. Need, some people don't know how to do it. I'll do this p- exercise with people and they'll answer very matter of fact, like they're taking an SAT test. Don't, you can't be introspective like you're taking an SAT test. Because SAT tests are answering questions correctly for existence to confirm and validate. You have to answer internally, meaning that if you answer in a way that only makes sense to you, that's probably more of the right answer than the answer that's going to be understood by other people. It's about you, right? Who are you? The goodness in you, the motivation, the really good motivation in you, not chasing things, but the the duty that you have, you know, everything that you really strive for, all that good stuff comes from inside you. And the problem is that we live in a world that pulls our attention away from ourselves. What do you think of Andrew Tateism then? Okay, that's where I want to end that conversation. Discord says the context Brittany uses to describe yelling, raising your voice to bring attention to your point of view would be different from what I'm considering as yelling. I've been in conversations with people that have... Like, they'll, what they'll do is they'll get in a fight with you. They'll be inappropriate crossing your boundaries. Then when you're like, hey, you're crossing my boundaries and they don't listen. And then they play the game of like, I'm the calm person. You're the one who's yelling. I'm yelling because you're violating my boundaries. And they'll go, but you're the one who's yelling. So I must be in the right. So when I say yelling to make it clear, like, oh, uh, do not, do not cross my boundaries just because that is me trying to be heard. Because like that was also my environment growing up where like you either had to be loud enough to be heard or you had to be like blunt enough in your language to not make the person use their like they do it unintentionally a lot of the time. People will manipulate a situation and say, I must be the one who's correct because I'm the one who's calm. You're not correct just because you're calm. But it is a good fucking tool that I think people pick up in like their childhood to use against others because they don't want to be introspective. I've literally had people cross my literal consent boundaries and I've told them, hey, you're being really inappropriate. I love you, but you're crossing my fucking boundaries. And they're like, well, you know, I'm the one who's calm right now and I I don't have yelling conversations with people. And I was like, well, I'm going to yell right now to make sure you can hear me. Can you hear me? I am safe wording. You are crossing my boundaries. And they're like, well, maybe you're upset because, you know, you're not in your right state of mind right now. I was like, Well, I'm not going to be in about five seconds if you keep fucking trying to trigger me. And that's the problem. When people are inappropriate and they're not being introspective, they've probably picked up this tool from their childhood or picked up this tool from their parent who's gone quieter than the kid or quieter than their friend. And they've used this as a technique to say, you're the one who's crying. 
you're the one who's who's out of you know who's out of control so I must be the correct one yelling and staying quiet could both be forms of manipulation or abuse but not always so sometimes you yell to say hey I will not let you do this I know what this is and it's not happening right now or sometimes you do become quiet because it's the right thing to do for the person who is out of control again intentions matter If someone, you know, often I think it gets triggered like in abandonment situations. I think sometimes people feel rejected by you because you're like, I'm not into this, whatever this is. And they're like, you don't like me. So they feel abandoned. And when they feel abandoned, they look at you like this criminal because you've abandoned them, but you didn't abandon them. You just chose yourself. And I think that's why I look at friendships, recent drama on the internet, not involving me, but other people. And I look at the way people act entitled to their friend's business And I say, this is inappropriate. It is inappropriate to feel entitled to people. And I will get loud so you can hear me, bitch. You are not allowed to cross my boundaries because you feel entitled. Sophie, you're wrong. Don't give that to people. Brittany, people don't pick it up in their childhood. They do it purposefully to harm. Where do you think they got it from? Where do you think they got the tools and they learned or they, they, it's like you're, it's either genetic girly. Or they literally pick it up from childhood because that's how they saw people interact. If you know a person and you know they're not traditionally malicious and they use that tactic, it's absolutely going to be trauma or purposely like, or it's going to be something they were raised with. You can hold people responsible for a trauma response. You can hold people responsible, but I'm trying to meet them where they're at. I'm trying to say like, I know you don't mean to do this, but you are doing it right now. I know you don't mean to do this, but that's what you're doing. And it's inappropriate. That's why I use the word inappropriate. When I don't think you're being malicious, when I don't think you're being on purpose this way, I say inappropriate because I'm trying to say you're doing something wrong, but I know you're not doing it on purpose. But you're going to continue doing it on purpose if I keep telling you you're doing it and you keep denying that you're doing it. And then it's like, hey, this is a problem. That's why I use the word inappropriate. Because I'm not trying to condemn you. I'm trying to say, hey, you're being inappropriate. And if they go, um, no, I'm not. And I'm like, well, when it directly involves my boundary, you are. You can keep doing it, but now I'm going to have to cut off contact or we're going to have to talk another day, right? But again, even going to that point has to mean something. Like I don't block my inner circle. That's like a rule I have. My inner circle, I don't block them. I just take time off, but I don't block anybody because like I love you. You're my inner circle. But people can get fucked up. You know what I mean? But somebody does everything like in different ways. Everyone has a different relationship. Every every individual is having its own relationship. And again, this isn't black and white. You can't use this method on all people, period. You know? Sophie says it's not my job to deconstruct someone like life to get them to not cross my boundary. Yeah, fine. But I also will make that effort for people that I love unconditionally. I will try to figure out why we're in this situation and what is happening and why you're being inappropriate so I can figure out how to maintain my boundary without abandoning people that I love because I don't plan on abandoning anybody in my inner circle. And that does mean that I do have to be considerate of why they're acting out, why they have their own traumas, why they're on their own journey, how they had their own life, their own upbringing, their own idea of what is right and wrong, their own fucking trauma problems. It is my responsibility as somebody that unconditionally loves people to understand why they're doing what they do while still maintaining my boundaries, you know? Dr. K gave a lot of amazing tools during this conversation. I watched most of it on my own already. So if you guys want to continue on your own, I do recommend it. I'm just fine, yet all I do is whine Not to you in my mind, cause I know I don't make sense I've been nothing but blessed So why's my life a mess? Please tell me, cause I'm sick of thinking Yeah, I'm sick of reaching out for the truth And living life as a fool Dun, 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 dun.